Let's go. Right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the RGM Experience Podcast with me, Carl Maloney. How are you doing, you uh, And we're here with another Sheffielder, old, old mucker from over at Pennines, John McClaw. Hey, up, pal. How you doing, dude? You're right. Yeah, thanks, mate. Thanks for joining us as well. It's it's very much appreciated. I know you've you've got a lot on. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, long time, long time listener. <laughs> well, yeah, thanks, mate. Happy, happy, happy to be back, mate. Yeah, thanks for having me. Well, I, I wanted to remind you and say a thank you because you, you took your time out about four years ago. When I just started this RGM thing properly, you were one of the, like one of the big guests that I got on my car driving about in my electric car years ago, and that from, is. from that that opened up a rate loader opportunity to get other guests in. So you know, I, I always oh, appreciate nice one, I, always, I always appreciate your time, mate, and I just wanted to remind you of that. I, you know, just a big thank you because oh, it, bless you. On the well, way. you've you, you've always you've always been good with me, mate. I think it's uh, I don't know if it's a Sheffield thing, Northern thing, whatever it is, but like you know, if you know somebody's well intentioned and they're all right you tend to you tend to do it don't you you know what i mean yeah yeah well so um i know you're busy uh i appreciate you busy you've got a big tour on the way as well which i've i noticed on your socials that a few more places have sold out as well recently so that's going well yeah yeah it's good um i mean there's been a real kind of peak a bit of interest in band because of that heat wave being such a radio hit last year it sort of everybody got into it and it were a, a bit of a zone like so Feel very, very lucky and blessed to be to be like, you know, selling out all these places. I'm hoping rest are gonna gonna do us proud. We've got two Sheffields on this time, both sold yeah. out, which is the first time ever really that we've on a proper tour like. So it's gone from strength to strength, really. And and this is before anybody's heard album. They've heard one yeah. one and a half tunes. You know, no, no, really. Um, so there's another single coming out, and then obviously the album in April, uh, April 28th, album's out. So yeah, it's just it seems to be going from strength to strength. For me, I feel very lucky because yeah. you know, as you as you get older, like you you think to yourself, "Where this won't last forever," but it it's doing, isn't it? I mean, more than three minutes, sure, Shankana. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know I, I mean? we're definitely going to come to the album in a bit more detail later on because I'm fascinated to know more mm-hmm. about this camel. I didn't I didn't see that oh. one, so I'm going to ask you about the camel later on, mate. If that's all right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Just uh, I'm, I mean, I'm big into camel game now. I mean, everyone knows. <laughs> oh, <about> <laughs> I did not see that one coming, and I found it. I found it brilliant when you put the new album cover out. It, uh, that is going to be the album cover, isn't it? You're not just taking piss. It is, yeah. It's me, <laughs> me and a camel on John Street. Yeah, um, no, so, yeah I love that. And 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 I mean, yeah, with Dear Queen died, so literally oh. a bloke comes to me, and I'm holding a camel in the middle of John Street. <laughs> Dear Queen's died, and I thought, I mean, this is definitely what she'd want, in it. You know what I mean? This is hard. This is a really fitting. Uh, I'll be holding camel in the middle of the road. So yeah. Bit of a mad one, but and he, you know what? He was lovely. Called him Brilliant. Coco, uh, and it, he's a celebrity camel, right? He's on. Somebody rang me up for a week, went put Channel Four, and he's on your mate. <laughs> put it on. Some sort of like Middle Eastern drama, and he's there. All right, just like, he's, he's like, like a rent. He's like your rent a camel. He's a good camel. You know, camels can be mar- the Mardi camels, aren't they? Yeah. They're spitty, aren't they? The Mardians, <laughs> like Rudy Voller. Remember him, Rudy Voller, <laughs> bit spitty. And uh, remember that when he spat him right cards there. Um, so, yeah, they can be moody camels, but this guy, oh, my God, he's a dream. Really? I'm like, you hold him like this, like, whisper like, you know what I you? You know what I you? But I know you, like, you're <laughs> quite tall, aren't you, you, you and all? So, like, mm. and tam- camels are quite tall animals. So, I, I can, and, and, John, just, and John Street, for people that don't know, is the street that Sheffield United's on. And you being a big Wednesday fan in Sheffield, did you get any funny looks <laughs> from, like, the... Oh, there were loads of that, yeah. There were loads of that. Like, what's he doing down here? I'm like, why's he got a camel? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? We're funny. Is they more bothered that I'm down that in the town than yeah. than they are that I've got a camel. Which says a lot about which says a lot about your average Sheffield United fan, doesn't it? it? Does, no, really? in all seriousness, <laughs> in all seriousness, um, our studio is not a million miles from Bramall Lane, so yeah. that's why I got him there. Right. Um, so yeah, I told him though. I says, I says, you see them there? I says, they're not as good as Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> were we doing some backing back tracks down there, and then were you down at studio? No, yeah. we just like we were kind of sort of com- uh, talking yeah. about ideas with record label about like, what to do. Yeah, eat wave in the cold north, and obviously Sheffield's the cold north, right? And I'm thinking we're what I'm I'm kind of bad at all that stuff. <laughs> and like one of guy Ian Carew, uh, there's him and this girl Roma who we've got a record label. They're both really cool, and um, one of them says, "You know what you need? You need a camel." Yeah. And I'm like, "You are." 
And then they showed, like, mocked an image up. And it were like this camel, like, superimposed over, like, Attercliffe or somewhere, in, in, or in, industry background. And I was like, you know what? Could be a zone, that. Laura loved it. Um, so that was that sealed deal. And they, 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 I said, I've got to be an ethical camel. I don't want to get animal rights. You know what I mean? You don't want all that here. Yeah. You've got to be, you got to be ethical about it. So this guy's he's, he's a very ethical camel. You know what I'm saying? But like, who did you, who do you turn to to get a camel these days? Who, who presses the button on that? Where, who do you phone? Like, just Google it. Well, this guy is part of all. I forgot what to call him now, but he's part of all who owns camel. He's yeah. part of all his circus family in Britain, right? You know, like Mr. Kites or something. He's that yeah. guy. And and since they weren't allowed to use animals, what they started doing in like let's say eighties. He's having these large animals that they sort of used for movies and this kind of thing. But they clearly, they love the animals and the animals love them and they treat them really good. It's dead interesting how they, and he's like, ooh, ooh. There's all these like sort of things you have to shout at them to get them to do certain things like, ooh, ooh. <laughs> so like, but I, we, I'm not just saying this either. He but, talked to me and I talked to him, Camel. Like we eat it off like soul yeah. brothers. But how long? Yeah, I'm, I'm like, I'm missing him. Well, we've done 10 minutes on the camel. I'm loving this. So it's, how, how, look, at, look at passion pouring out, man. <laughs> how, how were they like, was it like a big sad goodbye? Yeah, like felt a bit like, I don't know, like, whew, like a cross, cross Sahara on his back, isn't it? Felt a bit sad to see him go. One last little look back when you were on your way to... Like, yeah, that's it. Oh, bless him. It weren't mutual though, because he took some <laughs> carrots in like his pen and he went in, he oh, went in like shit yeah, double. So he obviously didn't feel the same enough. about me. <laughs> I love it, love it. Yeah. Well, just going back a little bit, I know we'll come back to the album and the, the tour and everything, obviously, soon. Uh, but in, in lockdown, I, I noticed on a recent interview that you did, that, that like during lockdown and stuff, that you that you worked harder than ever producing other people's stuff and mm. still doing music in the background, which I've not seen much about online yet. I presume it's, is, is, is there still loads of projects that are due to come out with, with, with you? Yeah, there's loads of bits and bobs. Did, did you did talk it. about there just like, like about what you were doing in lockdown and working with other people and stuff? Yeah, I did a thing that were on a Dyson advert in in like China. I think I think it's going to be on Aubrey as soon. Did like some music for that. Um, could you, I worked and writ, wrote some stuff uh, with this guy called Noah, who um, is a trans artist from South Africa. He's got a really sort of interesting backstory, um, and I helped him and did a bunch of stuff with him. Not just on, not just me, other people. Worked with his band, the Ramona Flowers. Did a, did a bunch of stuff for them for their album. Um, did loads of stuff, you know, really busy writing for myself as well, obviously. Um, and then kind of some commercial stuff. So just, I don't know why, but it all just seemed to come together for me in lockdown. And and, and I was getting asked to do things for other people, right? Which yeah. it's a real compliment. I think as you get older, people know you can do certain things and like you can help them and whatever. And it's been great to, to kind of do a bit of that stuff and all. Because I had people in my life, I used to have the Alan Smyre, of course, I feel legend. He used to sort of yeah. be that guy for me. He used to sort of produce and he'd help me with bits of music and just great, like, you know, good, good guy to have around. And I think sometimes you can, you can pass on a bit of your knowledge and that. And through that, I met this lad, call him Danny Lafron, Big Wednesday Art, lives in Valleys in Wales. Wow. Uh, we were working on something else and uh, just hit it off with him straight off. We were like, who's this geezer? Like, he's, he's, a, he's a great crackpot. Just loved him. And ever since then, me and him, we've been inseparable. He come and like, I've got this building in the back garden. And he come and like moved into loft. And he was just like, like living there like a bear that crawled up into loft at night when we'd finished recording. And he just lived there. So me and him just started writing loads of tunes, like for me and for other people. He's he's like, he's amazing, Dan. So yeah, lockdown, weirdly, I was, at the start of it, I was worried. I thought, well, how am I going to make my money? But it's... I don't know what, I'm like one of them cockroaches, man. everything just tits up, I'm one of them, you know what I mean? It's like crawling all over rubble and that. <laughs> it's, it's nice to like have a positive story from people in lockdown and stuff. And, you know, it's just, it's nice that, you know, creative people, there's still a way, because the, the creative industry had to fucking fight in it to stay alive. Um, and it's, yeah, I think it's nice to see that you've of, done well from it. Well, I saw the stats saying something like 80% of music professionals, right, have gone out of game. Yeah. Uh, in COVID and that there's not maybe like a tiny fraction of that's come back to it. Mm. So it is, it's worrying because because I said to somebody over there, I said, I used to feel like everybody I knew were in a band, I don't feel like that. They went, yeah, but you're old, aren't you? And I went, there is that. Mm. But a lot of young kids are saying the same thing. There's not that many people, not as many people doing music. And if they are, 
tends to be that more cerebral on a laptop in the bedroom thing. I'm not saying that's a good or a bad thing, but it's just a different thing. And it's something you have to get used to because it's a different world to when I come into it. You know what I'm saying? It's it's as a, like I put gigs on in Manchester now and Sheffield and mm -hmm. the, just, just the higher fees for venues is ridiculous now post COVID because they're just trying to claw some money back where they can, which is fair enough. Yeah, It just means it's more difficult for me to put Sheffield bands on in Manchester and Manchester bands on in Sheffield like I used to because... It, it, mm -hmm. in the past, it wasn't as much of a financial risk to try and help these bands get out of the city. And because I used to do a lot of swaps because yeah. I live in Manchester now. So I used to do a lot of yeah, shows. But it, now it's a lot more of a risk to not lose money myself because, you know, if, if I keep losing money, then I can't keep doing what I do. Um, so it's, yeah. that, for, that side for me is the hardest part of uh, and the biggest change post pandemic for me is like trying to be part of this grassroots music scene type thing. It's a nightmare. Yeah, and then you always hear these like frustrating stats, don't you? Like I think Cameron trotted some out a few years back, like music industry is making more money than ever. And I'm like, yeah, if you're Adele, Coldplay, yeah. Arctic Monkeys, U2, Ed Sheeran, maybe 1975. Like apart from that, at that level you're talking about, that grassroots level, there's not, there isn't a lot of money. There's nowhere near the amount of money there used to be. And, and I think like, You've only to look at places like Grapes and Boardwalk in our city in Sheffield. We've lost them, and the, the, the important places, they're gone. You know what I mean? Hacienda in Manchester, most famously. But remember Boardwalk? I mean, it's night and day still going. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so this is what I'm saying. It's, you've got to look, you've got to cherish these places and the people that make them places tick because they're important, I think, and we, we should look after it a bit more, eh? It's like the lead mold, you know, God knows what's going to happen there. I haven't heard out in a while, and, and night and day is going through a court case so they can stay open a bit later and have live music on because somebody's complaining that, about the noise because they've fucking moved next to a music venue. It's just... <laughs> it's like putting your head in the oven and saying, why is it hot in it? Like, what are you doing here? Yeah. It's just, it, it's just, it, it's, and, and again, it still feels like the music industry in particular or just grassroots music and this, you know, this place where we love, it, it's always fighting to stay alive, even after the pandemic, you know, there's, there's always mm -hmm. something, there's always summit you know, making it harder and harder. It's yeah, and, and, and I, I don't think as much as the internet's great and online's great and it's been a, a great thing in lots of ways for music, I think having physical spaces, yeah. there's something about physical spaces where people, are, are, are they have to listen to each other. They have to be in each other's orbit. They can't, you can't mute them or turn them off. You have to see them. You have to like let what other bands and other artists, other promoters, other managers do have some influence on you. And I think that's, that's, I'm going to put this light on. I've got this, oof, hello. <laughs> hello. Uh, but Laura's has bought me this um, podcast sort of set up thing oh, for when I'm talking to people and uh, got me on little, you know, my little light, oh, yeah. light thing. I've got, I've got one of them ring lights. Yeah. So I'm Instagram pretty. There you go. There you go. But yeah, listen, going back to, going, I've yeah. sort of tailed off and I'm on second to dinner, but we've just got to start looking after things. And obviously, led me in Sheffield's, prime example there's probably a bit of you know there's an argument on both sides of fence with that one but what i do think is venue can't be lost it's really important yeah. got to save it right and and yeah i think we've i don't know if i like maybe maybe i, I always think like there's, there's that venue trust isn't there? i mean that guy from venue trust and he's like a great fella but what you don't want it to be is a lot of old people like i want it to be like it were years ago it has to be modern and relevant still you know what i mean and it's a challenge it is yeah it's I, was, a challenge, but good well, luck to you. I was speaking to uh, jay taylor from music venue trust um who used to be the promoter in mm -hmm. manchester and there's it's it's there's more going on behind the scenes than just the lead mill and the night and day there's it is venues all over the country where the fighting to stay alive you know is it cost of beer and just sort of getting staff and all these all, all these places where Historically, the creative industry has been underdeveloped and funded by these fuckers that rule us. <laughs> yeah, I think that a lot of a lot of big venues now, they sort of corporates, right? They're all they're all linked to each other, so they, they've obviously got a lot more muscle. Same as festivals, right? You got yeah. one, two, three, four, five, six festivals all owned by the same people, so they can make them big offers. It's hard to mm. same it's same being a band man. There's, there's, you know what I mean? There's people. On that management, on that label, so they've got a bit more muscle about things, and you've got to try and find your way in that, and it can be it can be challenging for real. 
I thought after Brexit had called calm down and stuff, I, I thought the country would be a bit less divided as what it, it still seems to be a little bit. There still seems to be too much of a divide between left and right these days. There's nobody in, like safely in the middle, just like <laughs> having conversations anymore, is there? It's just particularly online. And, no, Twitter, no. and I know you've had spats on Twitter with people in the past and that kind of stuff. And Twitter's never been a, a nice place to be in an environment to be. But, you know, even away from Twitter, there's still, there still needs to be more conversations out there than just people saying, yep, you're wrong, you're right. And it's, I think there's a bit of a, there's a bit of a culture war, isn't there? You only have to look at this all this stuff about Prince Harry and whatever. It's like Twitter, especially, set up to be adversarial, but the world is quite adversarial. And I think we've inherited this from America. There's these two, there's like the liberal side and the conservative side, and they're just arguing all the time. And it's like it gives me a headache. I have to check out of it sometimes. Now I just mute people. You know, they're they coming. I think you're not yeah. you're not trying to you're not trying to learn. You're not trying to convince me. I'm not trying to convince you. You just you just want to win. So I'm like, just you. You can have a win. You win. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I don't care, man. You know, I don't, I don't mean I don't care about the world. I don't want to make the world a better place. But I'm saying you're not changing nobody's mind on on the internet. Forget no, about no. it. You know, you know just, what I mean? It's, we've got to find other other ways of reaching people. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, it's 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 a lot of wasted energy because I've had arguments over Brexit with people on Twitter and mates and that kind of stuff, and it's just. <laughs> N- nothing positive has, has ever come out of having a spat with somebody online, has it? <laughs> ever? I don't think. No, no. And I think like trying to like look around for people who are like preaching a bit of unity these days. What brings people together? Yeah. You know what I mean? What things that we can all think? Yeah, I mean, you know what I mean. I think you've got to try and find them things out because as much as I've got my beliefs in that, it's done a lot of rowing with me over the years, yeah. and it's not got you. It's like cracking your head against the wall. You know what I mean? I think. It don't make Maybe you it's, right. it's, it's a waste right. of time. It don't make it, it. It makes you feel shit as well, doesn't it? You are just like. That's why I quite like footy. I know, like obviously, you can yeah. then argue about which footy team you support. But what I mean is, you go to a football match and like it's meaningless, mindless, nothing. Really. It doesn't matter, does it? It's a game, right? It's a pig bag, and you're all just sat there watching it, and you might think one thing, and I might think another thing. But for these ninety minutes, we're on the same team. Yeah. We're all into it, and I think like that's why I, I like things like that because I think music's the same. Music same, you go to a gig, nobody's having a row at a gig, either. you're all there watching it, buzzing on music and that, feeling good together. And, and you know, I, as much as I've met political music, part of me thinks another job of a musician is just to bring people, it sounds a bit hippie and a bit woolly, but there's a thing like, just bring folk together, give them a good night out, let them get battered, mashed up, dance to tunes, jump up and down, get yourself off home, pucker. What, so what, it has to be what, sometimes. What I've always liked about Revenant and the Makers, and well, let me know if this is right. It's just an observation. Is that you've you've got your own like ecosystem, so you kind of like. It, 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 I know I know that I know you've got a team of people that you work with, but it kind of feels like you're mm-hmm. you're as you said yourself, like you know, there's nobody taking you, there's nobody stopping you making music. Um, you know, whether you no. know, you're not you're not like. Um, you can make an album when you're ready to make an album. It, it feels like a comfortable place to be because of the commitment that you've made to your career. Yeah, and also, like, I've, you've got to think I've been through, like, a lot of, like, versions of myself. So one bit I was like, uh, Alex Turner's mate. Yeah. Then I was like, big new thing because I'd had an it. Then I was like, he's an idiot. Like, guitar music is rubbish. You're out of fashion. Then I'm Corbyn's mate. <laughs> then I'm like, Gobshite off Twitter. So I've been all these different yeah. people, right? As I've been along. And I think there'll be some other thing. I'll be something else to somebody soon. You know what I mean? There'll be something else that, oh, you're that idiot, aren't you? Oh, you're that guy. I think what it's about is just plotting your way through it and trying to stay true to what you believe in. So there's things I do and things I'm about that I've always been about that I keep it. You've got to try and keep that like sense of your sense, which is dead hard. And obviously, more famous you get. I'm not that famous, but. I get it for people who are rape famous. It must be super hard to hold on to who you are because you become this other thing, don't you? And I've always tried to like, you've got to just stay right humble, aren't you? But like, I, I got a match with like my two lads, my best mate, my brother and my cousin. Like, I went to my mum's for my Christmas dinner. Do you know what I mean? You've got to keep them simple yeah. things. All right, I, I can go to Africa for two months and do all that stuff. But you've got to come back home. You've got to belong to somewhere and you've got to be about something. You know what I mean? Like being self-sufficient is one of the biggest, like, uh, it must be the biggest achievement in a band to have the holy grail of being able to earn, earn an income from music. 
And I, I see, I see a lot in when people are self-sufficient, I see uh, the powers that be, and this might be a little bit um, of a conspiracy theory, a little bit, but it feels like the powers that be don't like people being self-sufficient too much. I see it in America, no, no. you know, and, and they try and cancel these people of that are self-sufficient and, and influential away from the mainstream news. Like, I don't know, uh, Joe Rogan in America, where they tried to cancel him because he's got this big, massive audience. He tells things how he is. Yeah. Like this big personalities, like, like even like Jeremy Corbyn in politics, he were different. The, yeah. the, 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 the powers that be didn't like it. So they threw all the shit at him to, to give him no chance. So like when he, when he was popular. I, 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 just, I just yeah feel like there's there's a there's something um, there's something that I'm trying to look for here yeah, that I'm, that no I understand what you mean I mean there's definitely certain doors that definitely closed to me the moment I start talking about politics right and talking about things that were happening in the country at the time and and Iraq war and one thing and another and certain doors definitely closed to me and I guess you have a choice then to to give up which a lot of us do a lot of my content think of era I come out in there's me just doing this, right? And then there's Arctic Monkeys and there's nobody else. They've all gone. Maybe all of these other one, right? But like, it's just about when them doors are closed off to you, you think, well, number one, I've been true to myself and I've been honest. I've not played no games. I've been, so you can look, you send it mirror, number one. Number two, they're not shut forever. Sometimes they, they forget. People have forgot. Like, oh, I forgot you said that thing I didn't like. You just released a nice song and it's on radio too. I mean, me, we were one of the most political bands in country at one time, and then I'm on radio too, which is total over end of spectrum, and it? it's so comfy and like <laughs> Jeremy Vines on, and it's all like, do you know what I mean? And I love that. I think you can, you can be both all things, and, and it's all right to be to be it's all right to be older and make music that can be on radio too. And it's and and I mean politics, same as they always have been, absolutely. I mean values, same, definitely. It's whether I'm Am I better at putting them across? Do I shout at people so much? Not anymore, no. Yeah. I'm calming down. And that's, this is going to be the most unsexy thing I've ever said. That's age. You see, I see in my own dad, that sort of bullishness. Yeah, as older you get, it just, you haven't got it. It's not in you to do it. And, and that's me. I'm, I, I don't want to be shouting at nobody. No, I get you. And, uh, <laughs> well, just staying on politics a little bit. When, you know, just in, just in the news this week, the Tories are trying to, make it harder for people to uh, have their say like the NHS and it's, it's, it's they're trying to make it harder for people to strike and all that kind of shit. Mm, mm. Uh, where does it all end? You know, it, it, the, the China's it, it's total hip hypocrisy from the powers that be that are just forcing all. Yeah. The shit. It's just what mature, what's my point. So. The, the, well, I think the point that, is that we, we've seen it. We've seen it before. Yeah. Me and you have seen it before. We grew up in 80s Sheffield. So it, We've watched this movie before, haven't we? Strikes, industrial action, Tories. Do you remember being a kid? Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. This, but the, 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 hypocr the hypocrisy of them saying they're doing it to look after us when there's people in the NHS that are selling, you know, th there's not enough people to do it when everybody's working. It's it's just getting I mean, to me a little bit. It's getting to me a bit this week, you know, with just how much my dad's been a nurse for 55 for 55 years my dad's been a nurse you don't have to still be a nurse he could just be retired 55 years in nhs right and um he believes in it he was part of generation that i guess built it or at least their children he deeply believes in it tories took his job off him in the 80s and made him reapply for his own job retrain and reapply for his own job and they cut all he's a, he's a psychiatric nurse so a lot of the people he were looking at were just Made them homeless overnight. They don't get paid enough. We we grown up in this tradition. This is this is the this this trade union, NHS. This, this is my life. My mom come through nursing. My brother's an occupational therapist. It's like I'm the only one in my family who's never done it, right? And we all stood outside, didn't we? Clapping for them, right? Oh yeah, clap for nurses. You're telling me we ain't got money to pay them no more money. All money what's in this country what they've wasted on PPE and. One thing and another, right? All these terrible backhanders they're all on, all this Russian money they've all been taking toys. You're telling me there's no money to pay people who like wipe your arse when you're dying to pay them more money. It's, it's honestly, it's disgusting, man. If, if I'm honest, it's embarrassing, isn't it? Because you think, it is, yeah, this is so obvious, so obvious. And they did, I don't know, mate, they just they got it 
they got it all wrong. But I think the problem with uh, the Conservative Party is that they, they view everything as a math sum. Yeah. And not everything is a math sum. Let's say, let's say you're dying now and, and you're an old fella and look, nurses are all taking care of you and you, 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 they're, they're looking after you, right? Like, you can't put a number on that. It's not a numerical thing. It's it's like a, a soul thing. You should look after them people who look after us. It's just, it's just a moral... You know, and, and such as Reese Morgan claims to be a Christian. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that's not Christianity. Not as I understand it, anyway. Well, it, it, for the purpose Obviously. of balance, Tories, they, they did all right getting the vaccination out. I'll give them that, and then that's that for them, <laughs> I think. They did, no, listen... You're quite right, Ian. I think yeah. sometimes you, when you when you're on one side of the fence, you can be yeah. a bit biased, can't you? You can't. I'm like every foot. United could like win Premier League, sign Neymar, and I still be like crap. I'm just right, and I'm a bit really sharp. Uh, be a mat here, yeah, just. Oh. Uh, <laughs> well, he's an example. He's he's a pointing. He's an example, right? He's captain at football team who are our biggest rivals. There's no doubt about fat lads. And he's a nice kid. And he's a good human and he does things for charity. And he, I know he's a good person. I see it on internet and all them things. Same with politics, right? Sometimes they'll do something and you'll be like, like you're saying, that vaccination and all that, they, they smashed it. They did, they did really well with it. So I think you have to sometimes like game one, don't you? <laughs> do you know what I mean? Well, you know, I wanted to talk about a diver. About, I don't know. I just think you, you, I always feel like I learn something when I speak to you, mate. Um, because you, you know, you've, no, thanks, you've, you've, you've always had your, um, you know, your opinions and been, um, you, you're well versed in politics and that kind of stuff. So I always feel like I learned something from because I'm, I'm not that, nice kind, of, that kind of stuff. Nice right? one. Um, yeah, but that's that's. Can I just stop you to say it's all right? This is another thing nobody says this anymore. It's all right not to know. Yeah. So if you like somebody asks you a very odd question, you'd be like, yeah. I'd rather somebody went, I don't know, rather than go, well, let me tell you how it is. I just talk shit. You know what I mean? I think yeah. I think there's a bit of that this this day and age. There, is, there, there definitely is, and um, yeah. Well, what, what I've got, now, I've got a, a question from one of a previous guest for you now. Hey, just while we were just just well, just to close this little uh, section off a little bit, it's from Clint Bone. Okay. Uh, he's got a question for you, mate. So I'll just play his little question for oh, you. Clint Bone. Let's see what, what a legend one. Um, I've asked him many times over the years, <laughs> or I've told him that I think he'd be a great prime minister. Ah. How do you feel now, John, about the possibility of running for Prime Minister? Because we need you more than fucking ever. Oh, um, how do I feel about it? Do you know? I think I think the intrusion into your life, if you did that, would be would be for me. It would be very triggering for my mental health because it could be. Do you know what I mean? You'd be raking because they're, they're merciless, right? And I, I don't know if I could take it. Being right honest, I don't know if I could take it. Um, it's lovely that Clint thinks that, like. Uh, that Clint thinks I'm, I'm. Other things I worry about the competence of it. Like I won't. You know a bit about not knowing economically, for instance. I ain't got a clue. I can't even add up. You know what I mean? And I think you don't want me. When, like obviously you'd have chances with all economic experts, and you'd have to make a judgment call and whatever. But like I don't know. I don't think I'm qualified. Um, equally, am I more qualified than Liz Truss and Boris Johnson? Absolutely, I am. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like if they can do it, sure I could have a crack, but. I don't know, mate. I wonder if I've been a divisive character in the past. So, you know, would I would I be able to carry people's confidence with me? So, I don't know. Clint, it's not a no. <laughs> it's a, the answer, I'll no. get back to you next season, Clint. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the last time I saw you in real life, we were down in Illsborough dugouts for John Lines, mate, when you had a little press. Yeah. Uh, yeah, press yeah, thing yeah. and then you know, and the, that that's a nice canny way of just getting all the press out of the way, mate. I was impressed with that. Nice, nice little move. Well, I've just thought like, uh, you know what other thing is? I thought to myself, if I were a journalist, how often do you actually get to go to a press conference? You see them all the time. Yeah, yeah. It's a bit self, it's massively self-important, but I thought um, if it's in Wednesday dugout and I'm being a bit daft with it, yeah. it's all right. And it worked, it was fun. And I think like, I've never done a press conference before because I'm nowhere near famous enough to do a press conference. Oh, okay. But uh, at Cramlines weekend, obviously, because I'm local lad and that, and whatever, I get a lot of Press come to me, don't they? Right, so I'm thinking. Well, if there's a few of them, I'll have a conference. Like, I loved it. I loved. I, listen, I'm, I'm I'm lead singer in a band. Anybody who's in a band and says they don't like having like loads of attention on them, they're having the same thought. I loved it. When, <laughs> when, I, I, 
I didn't realise the Sheffield Star were there. I should. I'm, I'm just a bit daft. But when I asked you that question about uh, how do you feel like in a you know you know in a, a cost of living crisis that the, the Sheffield Star keeps banging on about your net worth and all that kind of stuff, and and I was sat next to Sheffield Star. I just thought, oh shit, here we go. <laughs> Do you know what, Carl? I, I genuinely, I didn't. When you said that, I thought, "Oh my God!" Well, I didn't wait to look. I thought, "Well, this is great <laughs> open." Yeah. So I thought, "I'm going to go with diplomatic." Like, yeah. well, oh yeah, they do get some silly ideas, don't they? <laughs> but, I mean, listen, four million quid is yeah. is. is you know, I mean, you know, we take my mum takes star. She loves it. Uh, yeah. Obviously, used to buy green as a kid. Nice one to be in star still, even in my like, childish age, I'm in star to me. Like, it's a big, a big deal, right? But like, I'm thinking I've got four million quid. I wish I had, I wish I had 400 grand, you know what I mean? That'd take that. The 10, like, I don't know, maybe it's like what the, I don't know, I don't know what it is, but they were way off at mark. And I wish I'd be putting a bit in for Wednesday, do you know what I mean? Like, uh, it just must be because you, because you are the other thing. Other, I went it. I've got one minute. Say again. Well, mate, no, I, I was because you, you are a personality in Sheffield, and I, I suppose, uh, it, did you ever feel like, oh, Sheffield are wheeling me out again every now and again? You know, no? like when there's something, like, when there's an event in Sheffield, do you feel like you're a bit of a spokesperson for this? Yeah, set? A, a bit, yeah, but equally, I love it, and I think like yeah. a bit of civic pride's all right because a lot of them they, be, they bugger off, don't they? The leavers, and I think like staying here, obviously, all he's all he's here, and Phil Oak is still here, and. There are one or two. I was talking to Martin Ware actually from Evan Seventeen, and he was saying, "Oh, you know, sometimes I think I might move back to Sheffield, John." So I've been into him to like move back. Um, but yeah, I, I, I mean, it's a relatively small pond, isn't it, Sheffield? And, and I love it. I love it here. I think it's great. I mean, if it were up to me, I'd live in Rio. You know what I mean? But my missus wants to live in England, so I think if I'm going to live in England, I might as well live in Sheffield. Why not? Why would I live anywhere else? Do you know what I mean? And I do, I do love it here. Uh, does it frustrate me? Yeah, it does. Are there things about it that I think are annoying? Yeah. But equally, it's it's, it's very good. It's all unique. I mean, you're not preaching to convert you. You're a Sheffield lad. But, like, we're not Manchester. We're not Liverpool. We're not Bristol or London. We've got our own energy and our own quirks and things about us. And, and, and in a creative sense, I mean, we touched on this last time we spoke, didn't we? But bring me the horizon. They're in arenas. Monkey's the biggest band going. Ratings are about unsigned band about to sell arena art. Self esteem's doing it. Yeah. Pulp have reformed the red line in all festivals. I'm having a like, you know, late career resurgence. It's like it's a, a mint place. Like, and even on that grassroots level, I was listening last night on radio, introducing, listening to Franz Vaughn, who, who I think is amazing. Um, you know, there were loads of great bands on that. And I think, like, it's on a creative level, it's a great place, Sheffield. Yeah. Warp films, of course. We're doing it, and it's not like what I think helping is that we've not been like, you know, you could you go to some cities and they're so gentrified now. It's like where are people? Where where are the people yeah. in Medley City? Like where have they gone? Like you know, like in East End, they're all in Essex, so it's like just gone. And you see it happening in a few other cities now. That that ain't happening in Sheffield. You know that that rate of gentrification, it's a it's a trickle, and therefore there's a lot of available old industrial land. But like you can have a studio, you can make fucking loads of noise and, and crack on and for whatever reason. You know, they used to say there was something, there's something in water. But there is, it, it is a thing here and it's not it going away, is it? It definitely is. One one thing that I always, because I live in Manchester now, I've been here four years. I don't know where the time's gone, mate, four years, but I'll definitely move back. Um, but what I do yeah. appreciate about Sheffield, when because I, I, I visit back most other weekends, what I do appreciate about mm -hmm. Sheffield, particularly coming from Manchester, is just how beautiful and green it is compared to, <laughs> compared to Manchester, where it's just like we've well, got uh, more trees than any other Western European city, yeah. yeah. And the highest proportion of alumni who stay in the city after uni, right? Which yeah. me, I think, you know, if you, people are coming from around the world and if they come here, around country, whatever, and they come and then they love it and they want to stay, it says everything you need to know about a place that doesn't it? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And it's nice to think there's a there's a story after industrial decline. You know what I mean? I remember all my uncles losing the jobs in eighties. And it was, Laura always says to me, she's like, what were it like? I'm like, well, for instance, you wouldn't get no sushi, Laura, <laughs> right? I said, if you wanted a coffee, there were one coffee shop, Pollard's, that were it. Like, <laughs> if you wanted a coffee, that's what you, And you weren't getting like an Americano, or you were getting like a cup of coffee, instant coffee, that were it. Do you know what I mean? And, and, Pop man used to come job and all them things. Pop man, used to come around. Pop man used to come around and that. Pop all man. that stuff, right? And then you, 
you, you think like now nah, he's buzzing, Chef, on, and creatively just turning it over. And I think it's a good plan. I'm very proud of it, mate. It's a, a great, a great place. I, I appreciate it more from looking at it from the outside a little bit. From when I were in it, it's easy to be cynical about where you lived and where you're growing up in it. It's just easy, and you can fall into a trap a little bit, which I think a lot of Sheffield people do, and I, I, I did. Um, but looking, looking at it from outside a little bit, I love that place. You know, it's just you're like a spaceman. You're like a spaceman gazing back at the earth, aren't you? Like, what a beautiful place I've come from. You know what I'm saying? I like that. That's going to be great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you, you can listen back to the uh, the press conferences on a previous episode of this podcast on number 48, if anybody's interested in listening to that. And at the end of the press conference, you, you announced that, the, you know, the week, the, a few days after Tramlines, you were off to Africa to have this journey, mate. So just talk us through, where do you start with that? So, I mean, I'll tell you the route. I went to Sheffield, London, London, Paris, Paris, Brussels, Brussels, Amsterdam, Amsterdam, Berlin, Berlin, right down to Barca, on a boat to Tangier, Tangier, Rabat, Marrakesh, get to Sahara. We can't go to Western Sahara because there's like a bit of a frozen civil conflict down there between these rebels called Polisario Front and Moroccan government. So we're thinking, where are we going to go now? Can't get into Algeria. Thinking, fuck's sake. So we fly over at Sahara. We land on at the source of the Nile on Lake Victoria in Uganda. We go to this music festival called Negi Negi, which was bonkers by the side of Nile. Everyone's like off the note. It was like a mental festival. Like you won't believe it were in Uganda, right? Come all the way down now. We're coming through East Africa. We've gone to Nairobi. Coming past Kilimanjaro, see all elephants and animals, that all that, met Maasai. Come down to a place called Bagamoyo. I'm hanging out with these Tanzanians, uh, musicians really famous in Tanzania called the Zawosi family. Then I've gone over to Zanzibar, had a bit of a vibe there. Wicked place. Come back to Dar es Salaam and we're going to get this train now. This old train from the 70s, what Chinese built through Bush up to Zambia. But day before I'm going, it derails. So I'm spared death, luckily. Only way we can get there now, we've got a flight to Zimbabwe, Robert Mugabe Airport, <laughs> right. and then we've got to go to Lusaka. And, and mental, right? And finally, eventually, we end up right up in north of Zambia near Congolese border at a place called Kitwe, which, you know, you go in record shop, you've always got a uh, most expensive box set behind counter on here, right? Zamrock. This is where this psychedelic rock scene were in, in the 70s in Zambia. Sheffield's twin city, they called it Zamrock, right? So we ended up there and we got nicked on a final day shooting. I, I was going to ask, I, uh, I you got nicked there. So t- tell us a bit about that. So I can't I can't say this where we are laughing, but behind where we were filming, there's a slaggy, right? You know, when you've dug a pit out, all next to when you're digging old, there's a pile in there. So it's all, all little kids in Zambia, they all in uh, Kitwe, they're all going on this uh, on this slaggy, they call it Black Mountain, and they're like going through with their hands trying to get nuggets of copper. Now, obviously, this is like child labour, so they think we're here to do human rights expose, don't they? They think like Louis Theroux's turned up or something. Anyway, all we're doing is using it as a backdrop because it's synonymous with town. But next thing, all these kids come out with these like uh, metal bars, they're all like, Gain it some, and we're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Next thing, all these coppers come with guns, chase these lads off who've got all these metal bars. Says, You can't film that, we're not having it. Get in, get in police car, take us down at cop shop, lock us up. So now they're looking through us phone, camera, out with this slaggy black mountain, they call it. Anything with this slaggy pond, you've got to delete it. So we delete it, but now we're flying from Lusaka in about six hours and we're right late. So we've had to like go on this mental drive all across Zambia to get us playing. So we're all a bit of a mental end to trip. But I mean, listen, musically, blow my head off. I can't even begin to tell you. Just bonkers. Was it? Because I know you did a lot of filming there for promotion for the album and that kind of stuff. Was it work-based or was it just a trip you just wanted to experience these amazing countries? Well, Part of it were collaborative, so there were artists out there all along that I've, I've yeah. worked with and, and done bits and bobs with. You know, that the first thing. And then second thing is my, my record label said, look, you can have a film, a bunch of videos, um, but realistically, nobody watches videos. They just don't, right? Like a few people on internet, what is it? 
you know, it's just more mush, really. You can do your lyric videos, they listen to it like that, but realistically, they weren't going to listen on Spotify or buy it. So I'm thinking, well, or radio, right? So I'm thinking, well, how what else will I do? They went, go on your trip. And originally, my trip was meant to be Chengdu. Chengdu Blades, remember them, right? So I'm going to Chengdu, Sheffield's Twin City in China, but because of cheese COVID policy, because of Putin's war in Ukraine, that's just not happening. And we have about a week to spare. They're like, why don't you go somewhere else? So I'm now I'm thinking, fucking hell, where am I going to go? Like we had it all planned to go to China, talking to all Chinese people. We've got it all linked up. I'm going to go through like Kazakhstan and all these places. Somebody says, go to Kitwe. That's that's one of Sheffield's twin cities. And on a whim, pretty much on a whim, we were like, right, they have to try and like, we'll go. And off <laughs> we went. So we had a raid time, you know, and, and some of the footage we've captured, I'm just in process now of sort of looking at it and finding out what should we do with this? Let's cut it up and start using it a bit. But some of the music, you know, uh, there's all these, a lot of people think African music sounds like Paul Simon or something. And there's all these electronic genres that are dead modern, what don't owe any debt to anything that we've got over here. So there's, Things like Singeli music in Tanzania and Chiriku. Uh, they've got this Kwam music, Kwaito down in South Africa. There's all these electronic things. This Negi Negi Festival, uh, this is where all electronic music from all over Africa comes together in this one place. And it means horny horny okay. in Swahili, Negi Negi. And government, they don't like it because <laughs> they think it's like, it's like a low key, like a bit of a queer festival, right? It's like a, there's a bit of an LGBTQ thing. And obviously, that's illegal in Uganda. So there's a bit of that energy. Government don't like it, so it feels a bit edgy. And the music's just off its head. Insanely good. Um, so, yeah, we're like a... I feel like I were like a... Being educated. You understand what I mean? Like, I've gone here to find out about stuff. Because uh, um, I think often we think we're going to tell Africa what's what, don't we? Yeah. But I think we a lot of things. It's other way around. They, they've got ideas about stuff that we haven't considered, especially musically. You know, so loved it, mate. Tanzania is the country. Tanzania, but I know historically before your other albums, you've been away, aren't you? Like, did was it before Mirrors? Was it Thailand? You went away, and then over over that Death of the King. I've recorded in other countries, yeah. Mirrors, yeah. Mirrors were in Jamaica, and Jamaica, uh, Africa, Death of the King were in Thailand. But before that, I've been in Africa a few times with Damon Albarn. He does that Africa Express thing. So I went to Nigeria with Damon to Felakuti's shrine, right, which were just like unbelievable I didn't quite appreciate what it were when I first went and older I get more I can't believe I went Ethiopia I went with Damon um, and obviously you're learning all the time right but I think I'm at an age now where I'm like hang about I'm a big daddy if you send now I can go somewhere yeah. and do a do a little thing on my own and do you know what I mean because when you're young you sort of sort of, you don't mind being under Damon's wing and you can watch what he's doing and how does he go off when he goes to these places but like I'm not scared I can go myself now do you know what I mean and I think it's time I just went and had my own adventures so, I yeah, loved it, man. I'm hoping to do more. I fancy Japan next. I'm going to go to Japan. It's just, it's just, it just, what do you mean? You know, it just looks crackers, and I just can't. I, I just want to get out of this, just being in England and Europe and just experience something completely different. That's that's what I fancy next. Tell you a right mad story about when I went to Japan, shall I? You'll like this. Go on. So, me and Laura, because a week before band, we're going to do all this press, radio, bit of telly, all this. We're playing a Fezzi audio. Go do it all. Go out with record label. Everything's nice. After a few days, his manager at time flies out. Now, this guy's managing Travis and all. He always managed Travis. So we go out, Harajuku. You know where it's in that Gwen Stefani house? Harajuku. So we go to here. We're in this uh, sushi place where it's like Sankey Ground. We're all sat down having a bit of food. There's like my manager and then like these two Japanese fellas, one young, one old, who were like summit to do it label which was Sony at time in Japan. So we're all having this bit of food and that. Anyway, after dinner, we're bringing us all this mad food, whale and all sorts of weird shit. Anyway, had a rate, Nate, loved it, loved all food. We start talking about like, um, what's your ambition? So Fran Ely from Travis has said something like, a bit Miss Worldy, like, you know, world peace or something. I've said something similar, something stupid, right? My manager said, I'd like to fly a plane around the world. Gets to this old Japanese guy now. This guy's not spoke at all because he can't really speak a lot of English. He's not said a word, so I don't know who he is. Just this old Japanese dude. I think he's he's called Ken. I think he wait. Ken sits steps forward. He says, uh, "What's your what would you like to do?" Ken he said to change things. Well, well, fucking <laughs> hell! Well, that's pretty. My manager says, "You don't know who Ken is, do you, John?" I says, "Name." He says, "Ken invented the PlayStation." All right. <laughs> 
mate, my head nearly come off. I said, sure. He went, he invented the PlayStation and the graphic equaliser. You know, wow. lights were up and down on the stereo. Um, Call him Ken Kutaragi, this guy. He's like chief exec of Sony. But he loves tunes. But yeah, so that would be Japan. Uh, that would be, I mean, listen, culturally, Japan feels so far away from any, all you've yeah. ever seen. It's, you, you'd love it, mate. That, that's why I fancy it. Just, up, just completely out of my comfort zone. Just, just, just. I don't know. I just, I just think I'm gonna, uh, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna hate not to be able, be able to read signs when I get on that. When I get on a train, I'm not gonna have a clue what I'm doing. But I, I want that. I want to just. Yeah, man. And Japanese people are great, right? They're, they're really cool people. Like go up into the countryside, up into Mount Fuji, and all that. Lovely mate. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. What, did, what's the biggest thing that you felt you've learned from your African journey? I've learned that the music we hear is only a very, 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 very narrow portion of the music that's out there. And that in some way, someone somewhere has narrowed things down too much and we need to mm. do that again. So that I'm obviously there were a time when because of the influence of South Asian immigrants and West Indian immigrants, British culture had that. You get bands like The Specials or you get Punjabi MC or you get these Asian Dub Foundation or you'd get like Soul to Soul. You know what I mean? You'd get these man You don't get that as much anymore. And I'm not sure why that stopped happening. And, and in Africa, they're doing that still. They're all taking, they're all obsessed with Nigerian culture. So now they need these Afro beats and stuff what are happening in Nigeria have like become the thing in the rest of the continent. We're all ignorant to all this. We don't even know it's happening. You know what I mean? And I think like you realize world stopping. World's not as enamoured with us as we think it is. You understand what I mean? Maybe 50, 30 years ago, they'd have been all singing Beatles or whatever, but they've got their own thing going on these days. And it's interesting to go and find out what that is. How, how much that's of that me, do you... That's me you, vibe. How much of that do you soak up? Because, you know, Heatwave, big reggae vibe to that kind of tune and, and, a, and, a, and a different direction for... Um, well, it, feel, it feels like a different direction to where you've been going with the last few albums, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, there's not much of an African thing on, on new album, maybe one tune, but I mean, in terms of E-Wave, that's me musically. It's me trying to listen to, like, my own dad's record collection, Barry White, Curtis Mayfield. It's more like that Philly soul kind of era. Uh, but then my thing is to, like, get more modern melodies. So my mate Dan, who I've been doing tunes with, he'll, like, um me a melody and then I'll do words. So we'll get the music up, then he'll have a melody. Because what I've noticed is a lot of ageing indie people I don't want to mention no names, but the male, aging male yeah. indie singers, of which there are many. You know, you'll hear the record. I'm an, I'm an a, oh, aging, aging indie fan. <laughs> there you go, right? And I think, like, you know, when you the, the artists we grew up listening to, you listen to some of the music now and you'll be like, oh, don't do that melody. You do that thing on the end of every line. like, And you always put that word in your song. Why do you have to say that word every time? Things like that, I've consciously tried to just not do that. You know what I mean? And for whatever reason, it's just everybody's loved it. And then, then to get that sort of reaction on Radio 2 and Record of Week and blah, 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 all, you know, all DJs messaging, saying they love it, back on telly, all them things. I'm going to say, I know, I saw, I saw you on Sunday, the other day on Sunday brunch. That must be a nice little show. Just when I saw, oh, fucking John's on Yeah, mate. Right, and that's what. Yeah, it's, it's weird being getting a bit of telly like. It's just a, it's just a, like, I guess that's part of what happens when you have a little hit on radio, right? People start ringing up again. You know what I mean? Like, oh, hey, up, I remember you. You know what I mean? So, like, what's it like yeah, we're nice to be on telly. What's it, what's it like? Be, what's it like being, are, are you are you watching the show from a distance, right? Or are you just in a in a room out of the way for a bit and you come out to do your song? Did you eat, like, no, we're on more for time, so obviously I would. Yeah. Did you eat some of his food? Yeah. Did you have some of Rimmer's food? And oh, stuff? I had loads, I had loads of snap, like, yeah, I loved it. And uh, we're on panel, weren't I talking, which I thought ah, right. was going to be playing, but they got me on as, like, a panel guest. And also, yeah, we sat there all the way through and uh, forged an unlikely friendship with Joe Swash, uh, Joe Swash, which you wouldn't expect, would you? <laughs> Me and Joe Swash to be pals, but yeah, I loved him. And um, it's great, mate. And what's weird is, you know, like um, when there were a time when I thought it had all gone away. You know what I mean? I did, I thought it had all gone. And to have it back, you sort of value it more. So like, you're a bit calmer, you're a bit more reasonable. You might just take it in your stride a little bit more. You're not trying to say a million things at a million miles an hour. You just sort of, you enjoy, enjoy it, about it, you know it what I mean? You enjoy it more now than like the early days. I love days. it, man. I love it. I love it. And also, like, I did, I did, 
a new a thing on telly over there for news, and uh, we're talking about Wednesday winning and like I was talking about my kids, you know, and, and they hear me talking about them, and there's that side of it where years ago it'd be like, Mum, I've been on telly. Whereas now I'm telling my lads, like, you know, daddy's on telly in a bit. And, like, it's just great, all that. Like, it's, it's like, magical because, like, they they can't believe it, you know. So it's, yeah, I love it, mate. I'm very, very, very lucky, really, because, you know, there used to be that booking chef in the back music. It's not like a proper job. And it in as much as I might, it might have its own stress set of stresses, it's not like having a proper job at all. It's a rake toss off in it. Let's be right. So I love it. I do. Well, that, that, that's why I, when I was talking to Clint, just to reminiscing a lot, but it's, it, it, it's not like you're working out pit, is it, mate? No, <laughs> no, it's not. It's not. And, and and you have to keep that in your head because I mean, we had this fan before Christmas. She got in touch with Laura. She says, "It's going to sound dead weird, but I've done your family tree all the way back to 17, oh. 1700s. Laura's like, "Why?" She's like, "I just find you really inspirational. I think you're cool." So sends Laura all these big chart so Laura's a bit cheeky she's like fancy doing John's then and all so she did mine now because Laura's off like well to do stock um you can trace her family back to like Jesus Christ or something because they've all they're all they appear in census records right my family now like they go back like three generations tops but what's listed in this thing is all the all the uh the jobs all the employment things and I, think, I like I know what these people did, right? Odd, odd, odd jobs, right? And I think to me, saying, "Fuck it, I'm, I've like broke some of here." Because my lad, my lads, they won't have to do that. I've like severed some of in chain here. You know what I mean? And and it, and it feels good that it does. It feels good because because like we were saying before, there weren't a great lot of opportunity in Sheffield in the eighties, were they? So to to have been afforded this life, I can't help but feel right lucky, can I? Well, mate, I, I, I can't wait. I, I've got tickets already for the second, for the Saturday gig in Sheffield. Can't wait for the tour, mate. I well, know. You're the Wally Bain ticket. I, I put you on guest list. <laughs> I right know, there. mate. I, I, I don't like to ask. And I bought your album and all because you, you just got it, haven't you? Bless you. Yeah. Uh, and so it's, so the tour then it starts on the 2nd of February. Um, you've and yeah. recently announced that, you know, I saw on your socials recently that you've, you know, you've got loads more dates have sold out recently. So I'm going to put a link mm-hmm. in the description of this podcast for people to click on to find a city near you where there's tickets left. Uh, I know, you know, Manchester. Manchester, Liverpool, Manchester, up north, Manchester, Liverpool, because yeah. the big venues. Some, we've done two Sheffields this time, so there's yeah. a bit of that as well. Right? They've both sold out a third time. Manchester, there's some tickets left for Newcastle, I think, and Liverpool. They're the ones in the north. And then maybe Bristol, Cardiff, and I think there's an handful for Northampton, rest of sold out. So, yeah, can't fault it, mate. Is there going to be a, a, all the hits? So uh, I just want to look back at some of the songs to the history of the band, um, you know, because I presume it, these are my favourites anyway. I just uh, If you give us a couple of words on each of these songs. So we'll start with Heatwave and the Cold North. Heatwave first. Pure banger. Pure <laughs> banger. Black Widow, Rachel. Yeah, dropped it from this set, though. I think it's hard, hard ah. Mm, it's hard. It's hard for the first time. Might come back though. Okay. Too tough to die. Yeah, you like they like them rockers. You call, I do, yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, there's a theme in there. They, yeah. They're all they're all a bit like yeah. got a riff. Oh, we a riff on them. Okay. Yeah. Um, heavyweight champion of the world, obviously. I mean, I think I'd be be hounded out of town <laughs> if I didn't play that one. <laughs> Open your window. Yeah, always, always. Yeah, always Steve Edwards on the on the samples. And what was the I- one? And last one, I can remember uh, when you were supporting Oasis, walking back from the bar with about four beers, and just hearing Laura on the, or Laura on the, is it a cornet or trumpet? Trumpet for silence. Trumpet, yeah. Uh, and, and that amazing, every, right? Every time I hear that, I just, it always takes me back to walking through Eaton Park, you know, just before Oasis and you guys being on and yeah, Laura on the trumpet. Good memories, man. Just that, just that. that you know, takes me back to that time. You know what's frustrating is I, I do it for all people to sing all the lyrics and all that and jump up and down. When Laura plays that riff, because everybody's doing it, and I just think, I always sometimes look at her playing it and I think, oh, I wish I could play that because like everyone's sing, everybody single human who ear is singing that with, when you play it. It must, must be quite a feeling that for her. I've never really asked her what that's like, but it must be a, a great buzz that for her. And it obviously closes a set. It's always a sort of last song, so people love it. They do. And it's great. I love it, man. And you know, to do that with with your wife, um, it can be challenging sometimes. But I've, that's other reason I'm blessed. I've done it all with like, unless you climb a mountain and turn around and there's nobody there, 
it's like, do you know what I mean? It's like, oh, isn't it a nice view? There's nobody there to share it with you. So that's what I've heard here uh, uh, throughout years, um, sharing it all. It's been a great vibe, really, because, you know what I mean? I'm a bit bitter of a romantic me when I get to it. And sell the new album to us, and what can we expect from the new album? With the camel on the front. We've done the camel story earlier, so... Yeah. You can expect a modern, soulful, northern, if Frank Ocean made a record with Ian Brown. <laughs> you, That's you, what you'd get. You, you were definitely stoned for your second single from it, weren't you? I was very... Yeah, the, tell you the reason I released that. Because, <laughs> because the uh, heat wave went on so long yeah. into Christmas. We were like, well, we can't release another single because we'll, if we go on radio now, we'll never get on because it's like Michael Bublé and like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like Rod Stewart's Christmas hits or summer. And we were thinking, wait, what should we do? So we were like, let's just not try and get on radio and just release a song that can't be on radio. And we're like, what have we got like that? Like, I know, I get high all the time. That should do it. <laughs> and, and yeah, there you go. So it weren't, I think it was just a way of saying, look, there is new, some other music coming, but for now, I just have this. It's almost like a B-side, you know yeah. what I mean? Like years ago, you'd have done a B-side. But you don't really, no one has B-sides anymore, do they? But it's like a B-side, like just here's another mood that's not meant to be yeah. in the cold north. It's just meant to be this, this other thing. And so um, this month, end of this month, there's a song called Problems, um, which is, that's that's more like Eat Wave. It's like a pop song and it's a, it's a single and it's an earworm. And it, it's, my, it's the best song on a record. Let me say that. It's great. I love Problems. It's just such a tune. It's great seeing Revan and the Makers thriving again and, you know, you just enjoying it and, and cracking on and just mm. creating great music again, mate. You've got a knack for it. Yeah, mate, it's nice. And um, I'm hoping people are going to take this next one in spirit. It's meant because I don't know how I would describe it to you. It's like a TLC. Imagine if, like, I sang a TLC song. Go on. Oh, that sounds great. It sounds a bit like, ah, you what? <laughs> but, like, imagine if I sang a TLC song. That's what problems is, and, it, and it's like it's a banger. I'm not gonna lie to you, and, and I have to be honest. Like I'm a, me, I'm a, I'm an artist, right? Like I'm chasing that perfect song all the time, and and I've got so close on this album. I ain't got it. I want more, right? I want more, um, but I, I've, I've got as close as I've ever got to. No such thing as a perfect Sing song, it. is there? No, I know, I know, but you know, like even that, <laughs> like even that, like possibility that it could exist is like, oh, I've got to find it. It's like El Dorado, you know what I mean? I've got to find it, right? And, and, and that's what keeps. I look at them, I look at like uh, Dylan, Paul Weller to a degree, Debbie Harry, these people who like, they're still doing it, still making music, they love it. And I think that's what they're after. And it'll, they'll, they'll die, not, they'll die. Unsatisfied, and not like don't be wrong, they'll have had a great life, and they're like, Yeah, man, I'm, I'm Bob Dylan for a life. But they'll, they'll, a little bit of them won't be sated because they, they just they're after that thing. I went to see Paul Simon on his last tour, yeah. and he got this tune. I don't know if you heard it, wristband. I, I'm not, I don't, know. I don't know. So, Paul Simon had this tune before he like made his, on his last album, he had this tune, wristband or pill to my album, and it's on about not being able to get into his own gig because it's security guards being oh, right. and asking him for wristband, right. Me, I swear to God, it's sublime, this tune. Like, if you were 18 and you released that, you'd want to think you were, like, next big thing, right? And I'm thinking, this is a geezer who's 80 years old. He doesn't have to do it. Could just be... You're Paul Simon. You, you've been a legend 800 times over. You could just be sat there with feet up, or grandkids and that, and he's, he's still like, I've got, to, I've got to get it out. I've got, I've got to get it out. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Love it. No, mate, well, uh, again, you know, I always appreciate your time, mate. I know you're busy, John. Um, and really appreciate your time joining us for another edition of the podcast, mate. Is there anything you just want to share with the Rev Army just to get them all just to, like to, for the people that haven't pressed the button yet? Give them a few words. Just like to say, see you all on tour. Please buy my album and big up everyone, uh, RGM Magazine, uh, for all hard work you put into supporting grassroots music because you are the ones who make it happen. And, and when people get up there, it's because of likes of you for real. Oh, cheers, Paul. Thanks for that, mate. Enjoy the tour and I'll right, see if you're a pint of you, mate. Cheers, pal.